How did you become interested in gerontology? Well, I think it started when I was in college. Um, gerontology wasn't even a field when I was in college, 1965 to 1969. And I took a summer and holidays job at a nursing home. Um, we didn't have much training back then. I think it was, you know, not like they do today. But uh, we had um, maybe four or five hours of training how to do a blood pressure and all sorts of things. But oh my gosh, the tasks they gave me. It was, it was interesting. It was actually a psychiatric facility, a private psychiatric facility, but it included a nursing unit. And um, so I worked sometimes in the cottage with teenagers and sometimes in the cottage with young adults. But I, I spent a lot of time in the nursing home, and actually the people then had a diagnosis of organic brain syndrome, not even Alzheimer's disease. I think Alzheimer's disease was used when it was someone who was very young, like what we would call young onset. So there were those people who had that diagnosis then, but mostly a lot of people had a dementia, and um, it was called organic brain syndrome. And I was fascinated by that um, experience that they were having. Um, I did an extraordinary number of almost skilled tasks. It was quite incredible, really, what I did. Um, but I loved, I loved the work. Um, I did, it did not want me to become a nurse and make me want to become a nurse. It did not make me um, want to go into long-term care necessarily, but I just was um, pretty fascinated by this experience that the older people were having. And it's not like dementia became a, an area of interest for me at all, not at all. Um, but I think it made me feel comfortable with long-term care settings and the, the, the chronic illness experience, just personally really comfortable. Mm -hmm. I will say it's not that I love old people, it, because I love people in general, but I love children and teenagers. and. So it's not that, but I am so fascinated by the aging experience mm -hmm. on a personal level, family level, community level, but very much on a policy level and a social justice level. Mm -hmm. So I was always sort of drawn to that. And then when I was, t I, I actually got my degree in social work, um, my, actually my undergrad was in, in psychology and sociology, then I got a master's in social work straight out of undergrad. Um, and when I was, I was teaching then at Miami University, and um, I, I was not, I was teaching social welfare policy, mostly social welfare and group work and things like that. Um, and then I got a call to do some consulting at a nursing home. Again, I felt quite comfortable doing that um, and started doing a lot of consulting in nursing homes for the social work, for the social workers in nursing homes. Um, so then I started to see how the field had grown. Um, uh, meanwhile, at Miami University, we had something called the Scripps Gerontology Center. So I was, I was, even though I was teaching social work and social welfare, I was around a lot of gerontology. So I had a lot of um, beloved colleagues who were gerontologists. Started doing that nursing home work. Um, just got more and more interested in the, the, the social aspects of gerontology and uh, of aging. Um, and decided to go back to um, graduate school to get my doctorate. Got that in social work with uh, with pretty clear focus on aging. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it really started in a sense of fascination with the aging process and um, um, that really complicated experience of dementia, I'd say but uh, expanded much beyond that after that. And I would say very little what I do is specific with those focused on dementia, but inevitably involves people with dementia. Yeah, yeah. So in some ways you've answered the next question, at mm -hmm. least in part, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask it anyway because I want to make sure that, it, that we capture yeah. it, which is um, to describe your career trajectory mm -hmm. as a gerontologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm trained as a social worker at an MSW and a PhD in social work, and um, and because I started teaching in social welfare and was in this um, environment where there were so many active um, people in gerontology, uh, the Scripps Gerontology Center was attached to my department in some com convoluted, complicated 
way, but um, so I had that exposure and um, went to many of the lectures and had those people as my as my colleagues saw the research going on, um, and and then when I went to get it was not until I went to get my doctorate that it became very clear to me that would, this would be a wise focus for me. Uh, because I was already at a university where the strength was very clearly in, in aging and um, where the reputation and the opportunities were really, really big. Um, and I got a lot of good advice from my social work program when I was choosing really where do I want to go in, in the world of social welfare. Uh, I got good advice to sort of say, go where the strengths are in the place you live, in you know, the place you have your experiences now, and the geographic place I lived. I wasn't expecting to really leave. Um, so I just then uh, chose a dissertation that was involved in, in aging, very clearly uh, in aging, and um, took courses where that became all of my focus, and, um, and then started doing all my research in, in aging, and became a fellow at Scripps. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. But I've since retired from teaching, uh, I te so, oh, I started teaching. That's important. I started teaching the gerontology courses um, after uh, the social work program moved out of our department, and I asked to stay. I was very interested in staying in the College of Arts and Science and where Scripps was. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I made a very clear decision then to have gerontology be my my focus, have it be my uh, research, and to have scripts and, and uh, Department of Sociology and Gerontology be my home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But so I've retired from teaching and gone back to, to doing research. So I retired, I retired a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and now I'm doing research only. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do research Long trajectory. Scripts, yeah, my research is all through scripts. So. Mm -hmm. um, I was a research fellow all during my teaching at at, um, at Miami. After after I got my PhD, I was a research fellow, um, and then as I came back to Scripps as um, a part time, seventy percent, so sort of part time employee, then I um, am a senior research scholar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, at what point in your career did you embrace? gerontologist to describe such, yourself? Yeah, it's such a good question. Because not only was I having that challenge of defining what it meant to be a gerontologist, and do I even use this to de describe myself, mm -hmm. but all of our colleagues and the students were having you know, this question, what does it mean to be a gerontologist? Um, and I, I remember saying at one time I would never not call myself a social worker, because it's part of my soul that social justice ethic of social work and um, um, interested in all populations who are disadvantaged and, and that. So social work is very much at, at the core of me. But as I was teaching more and more gerontology, um, I simply s began to think more of myself as, as a gerontologist with a background in social work. Mm -hmm. um, and I always say that. I always say those two things because they, they go quite hand in hand for me personally and I think just generally, in, especially in the fields in gerontology that I, that I uh, do research in, um, they, go, they go very much hand in hand. Policy issues, practice and program issues, very much hand in hand. So I, I remember personally just sort of saying, well, I just said I was a gerontologist, you know? I, I just, somebody asked me what I do, and I said, I, I'm a gerontologist, and I thought, D did I just say that? And I let go of the social work, and why did I say that? And um, did I, and I always said, I'm a gerontologist, of this, I'm in gerontology, the study of aging, you know, like I'm educating at the same time I'm saying it, but I think I said I was a gerontologist because I was studying aging, and I was teaching aging. Uh, for a while, our program had no one with a degree in gerontology teaching gerontology. So we, we were very much a multidisciplinary department. Um, since that time, as the field has grown, the field of gerontology and the degrees in gerontology, we, we have um, 
faculty with degrees in gerontology, but we were all struggling to say, can we call ourselves gerontologists when we're granting degrees in gerontology and we're telling them that they are now gerontologists? So what a dilemma. And still not really clear as we're really growing, you know, as a field. Um, but I think I just sort of heard myself in a couple conversations and then had to listen to that and then say, what does that mean to have just said that? And, um, and then I just started claiming it. And I think especially because I was in a department of sociology and gerontology, I, I said I was in the gerontology faculty. Um, and, and yes, I um, engaged in those discussions and I think I made a very intentional decision at one point, not all that long ago, maybe eight-ish years ago, to just say, yes, I am a gerontologist. And, um, and I feel confident about that. I'm not apologetic when people say, well, I got my degree in gerontologist. How can you do that? And I can say, I'm a gerontologist in 2015. Mm -hmm. And maybe people without those degrees, I don't know how this is going to go. You know, I don't think we know how it's going to go. Maybe people in 2030 will not be allowed to say that. Who knows, there may be, you know, accreditation and certification, and I don't know how that's going to go, but today I would say I can say I'm a gerontologist in, in, in yeah, 2015. Yeah, I'm a gerontologist. Great. Did you have female, female mentors who um, impacted your movement into gerontology? Who were they? How did they impact mm -hmm. you? Uh, I would, I would, I'll say, I mean, four people. Yeah, I can just say them right off the bat because I've talked about them before. Um, I would say first would be Millie Seltzer, who was a revered uh, gerontologist um, and was uh, the associate director of Scripps. Um, uh, she left us too early, but as a grand older woman, um, she. Um, she clearly mentored me. She read some of my work early on when I was doing my first research and writing. Um, she mentored me uh, as someone who studied aging, and she had such such great ways of thinking about aging, just way outside the box and provocative. And um, so I, I had wonderful conversations with her and with groups that included her. And then she just was such a grand example of aging. Um, uh, so she very much inspired me. Um, and I didn't have enough time with, with Millie. Others had more time with Millie than I did. As a matter of fact, in, her, in pretty much her last years, I was so focused on getting my, my PhD. Uh, I was commuting to get my PhD and um, didn't have as much time as I wish now that I had before she died. Um, the other one was one of my, actually one of my social work faculty members who was um, the person who said, who took me to lunch and sat me down and said, you know, I hear you going in a couple of directions with your PhD in, in, in social work. Um, uh, I want to encourage you to to see yourself in, in aging and that being a good place for you. And she was really doing this as a, um, I would say, pragmatic kind of strategy for me. Um, you will have many research opportunities because of scripts. Um, your skills and, you know, sort of um, approach and sort of worldview fit really well. And uh, she just kind of helped me make that make that decision, and so I would call that a, a pivotal mentor. You know, she wasn't, she uh, she's not in my life anymore. And but it was a pivotal mentorship moment, mm -hmm. um, just you know, a two-hour lunch, and I'm very very grateful f to her for doing that. Mm -hmm. And then my other mentors are sort of peer mentors. Um, I would say Lisa Grover was a mentor to me because um, she was a bit older and. Um, wise and amazing and um, challenged me all the time in, in my personal choices about research and in my um, thinking about aging. And she was seven years older than I was, so a little bit of a, a certainly a peer, but um, um, an, 
a bit older than I, so I, I very much look to her for some of the some of the approaches she took academically and personally. So that was, that was she was very important to me. And I would say another peer mentor is Suzanne Kunkel, who's our director at Scripps. And Suzanne is also a great friend, as is Lisa Grover. And Suzanne. <coughs> I would say is my peer. As a matter of fact, she and I were getting PhDs at the same time, and we were writing our dissertations at the same time, and we'd be late at night in our offices at Upham Hall, and um, kind of kept each other going, inspired each other. Um, she has since kind of soared well beyond what I've done career-wise, but uh, now she's the boss of me, and um, and but she's. Uh, such a good thinker. I can go to her with any kind of challenge I'm having um, about um, sort of professional dilemmas, but in terms of gerontology, I really respect her judgment about research approaches and about how to frame good questions and, and answer them, especially in evaluation research. So mm -hmm. she's been she's been great, and she she's such a hard worker. So she. Um, She's, she's pretty inspirational and it helps me with a lot of decision making, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's unique about being a woman gerontologist? <sighs> Cliché, but it's, I, don't, I guess I don't hear it as much anymore, but for a long time people were saying aging is a woman's issue or a women's issue. and. Um, I think all the reasons we know that they tend to live longer and um, certainly very old age feels somehow like a, a woman's issue. Uh, I don't, I'm not hearing that as much anymore, but I remember thinking about it and being very aware that I would likely outlive my husband, for example. And um, um, I think as a feminist, uh, I've always been aware of um, sort of the social stratification of, of gender and certainly age and, um, and the intersection of those are, are very present in my life personally and as I observe and, and work with all the people I work with, I do a lot of work with caregivers and those kinds of things. So I kind of resonate with some of the, some of the issues of, um, of aging that um, intersect very much with with the roles that women play and sort of some of the secondary nature of their, their roles. So it's a really hard one to answer, but I think that um, I, I, I'll also say very frankly, um, I think there's a bit of, sometimes I've felt there's a bit of a uh, old boys club in gerontology. Um, I remember m moments of seeing a cluster of men, say, at GSA and walking up not sure whether I would be fully embraced as one of the, the guys, um, and I'm not, but as one of the gerontologists and um, even overheard some conversations uh, among men that felt like, you know, old boys club. So I think uh, women certainly are in leadership positions now in gerontology, and I think we've come a long way. Um, but given the fact that we were seeing it as a women's issue for a long time, aging as a women's issue, and the field being dominated by, by a lot of men, um, I, I never lost um, an awareness of that. It never made me fighting mad, but um, yeah, I... Certainly studying gerontology has made me much more conscious of my own aging plans and my own aging experience, and there's no, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. That just happens to be the next question, okay. which is, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Okay. Well, I'm 67, so I um, am aging. We all are. Um, but I know that I'm going to be aging more rapidly, and I know a lot about that process because I've worked in, uh, in um, 
a lot of research areas that required people to look ahead to their, I, I did a lot of research about how people make decisions about current situations, but also planning for the possibility of becoming dependent on others later in life. And um, so I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people um, about how they think about their own futures, and that has certainly affected the way I think about my own future. I wouldn't say I'm any better planner. I wouldn't say I'm um, any better at aging because I know so much. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think it makes me self-critical. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but it it um, it has prepared. It has helped me put myself in the context of a whole range of ways of thinking about aging and and do a lot of comparison with others and come to understand my own my own um, my own fears about aging and my own um, celebration of it mm -hmm. because I have both you know and I can have both in the same day or in the same moment um, Part of my work as a gerontologist has been interview-based. The hugest part of my work as a gerontologist has been interviewing others who are, are dealing with aging in their families or are dealing with aging themselves. And, um, and you can't help but reflect when you're interviewing other people. Um, and I think that's been just great for me in a lot of ways. And um, but I do want to emphasize that it hasn't necessarily made me any better at it. It's just made me more self-aware. And, um, and my own aging, I do believe, this is very important, my own aging, I do believe, has made me a better interviewer in some cases. Um, uh, relating to some of the subject matter is not re a requirement of being a good interviewer at all. Mm -hmm. It's just the lens that I take to that experience, and I do think I've gotten better and better with age, and as I've come to, come to understand all of these experiences through, through, through my own uh, aging lens. Mm -hmm. So I do think I'm a somewhat better interviewer. And sometimes people connect with me in a way I think they might not with, with a, younger, a younger researcher. Mm -hmm. Um, I have studied caregiving um, a lot, and um, a lot of my research has been about caregiving, um, and I've been a caregiver. So while I was studying caregiving, um, doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, evaluation research, but also just a lot of basic research about about the caregiving experience. I was uh, caring for my mom who had Alzheimer's disease, um, and my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So here I was um, doing all of these interviews and then having this experience myself. And sometimes I wished I were in any other field mm -hmm. than, uh, uh, than aging because I just was a little bit too overwrought with, with all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I'm glad. I'm glad that I, um, I think the things have contributed to each other. My experience with caregiving contributed my, to my, again, the lens that I use. So it goes beyond the aging lens. It goes into the sort of the, the experience lens, the actual the world I live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, those other experiences have helped me as a, as a caregiver, actually inspired me mm -hmm. as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then I've got this dad who's 96 years old, who's like the bookends, uh, book, at bookends of the ways to grow old. My, my mom, who uh, really had a hard time with her Alzheimer's disease, and my 96-year-old dad, who's healthier than I am and more mm -hmm. as active as I am. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's uh, inspiring also. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women mm -hmm. gerontologists. Mm -hmm. And within that framework, is there anything else you'd like us to know? Wow. Say that sentence again. So, sure. that I, uh -huh. so the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. OK. OK. I do believe we have examples of legacies all around us, all of these incredible researchers and scholars and teachers um, all around us, and I'm, I um, 
take those legacies very seriously in terms of myself. You know, I'm grateful to those, those legacies before me, and I do think we owe people to leave some sort of legacy. I'm not sure what mine is. Um, I know it in personal relationships. I know I'm leaving legacies in, in personal relationships I've had with students, fellow researchers, even in one, one and a half hour interview with someone I've interviewed with, I know I've left them something. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of grand legacy, that's, I think that's yet to be determined. Maybe something that I've created through my thinking and my research will change, maybe the little butterfly effect or something. Um, um, I am confident that the work I'm doing now is going to change the lives of people in their homes, for example, in the state of Ohio, and mm -hmm. it may have an effect elsewhere. And that's enough legacy for me, you know. I don't think I have to have a plaque somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but those, those um, small legacies of, of those very intimate personal relationships I've had with colleagues and students and, and research participants, and then those the impact of my work, my applied work on policies and programs, that's enough.